morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Daryl Harris, Chair of the Department of Political Science. Welcome to our students and a uh, special acknowledgement to Associate Provost uh, Reedy. Uh, thank you for coming this morning. Today is Constitution Day. Uh, Constitution Day is an American federal observance that recognizes the ratification of the U.S. Constitution and those who have become U.S. citizens. It is observed on September 17, today, the day the U.S. Constitutional Convention signed the Constitution in 1787. The law establishing the holiday was created in 2004 with the passage of an amendment by Senator Robert Byrd uh, to a spending bill in, um, in 2004. Before the law was en enacted, the holiday was known as Citizenship Day. Uh, in addition to renaming the holiday Constitution Day and Citizenship Day, the act mandates that all publicly funded educational institutions provide educational programming on the history of the American Constitution on this day, um, September 17th. So let me introduce um, Professor uh, Jay Stewart, uh, who is, as you all know, um, our pre-law advisor in the Department of Political Science. Um, uh, Professor Stewart is, Stewart is a consummate uh, organizer, so I want to uh, uh, sing praises to him for organizing this program. Professor Stewart. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Constitution Day. Uh, as Dr. Harris mentioned, today is the anniversary of the signing of the Constitution. And I just wanted to remind us of what the Constitution is about by reading the preamble of the document. The preamble of the Constitution reads, we the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, to ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. As we know, in 1787, when this was signed, uh, it didn't include all Americans um, in its promise. And what's happened since then is a constant effort to perfect the document. And the main area in which that's done, of course, is in the area of civil rights. So we have with us today two experts on civil rights law who I'd like to introduce. Uh, to my immediate right is Professor Addison Francois. Professor Francois is a graduate of NYU and NYU Law School. He taught for several years at NYU after, I'm sorry, initially working at Paul Weiss, a law firm in New York. Uh, he spent about eight years uh, with NYU in their lawyering program. And in 2005, he joined the faculty of Howard University School of Law as the director of the Civil Rights Clinic. To his right is Lexer Kwame. Lexer is a graduate of Harvard College and also of the University of Pennsylvania. I've neglected to mention both of these folks have clerked for federal judges. Uh, Professor Francois clerked for the Honorable A. Leon Higginbotham in the Third Circuit. <clears throat> Excuse me. And Lexer clerked for a federal judge, sorry, a federal judge in the Eastern District of Virginia. Uh, she also worked for a firm for a couple of years and then began to work for the Center for Law and Social Policy. And in the past year, she's come on board at the Leadership Conference of Civil and Human Rights. So what I've asked each of them to do is to describe briefly their work in the area of civil rights. And then I'd like to turn it over to students for questions. So let me begin with Professor Francois. Okay. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm thankful for, uh, to Professor Stewart for inviting me today, and also grateful for all of you here. Um, I'll try to keep my comments brief so that we'll have more time for questions. As Professor Stewart said, um, I run the Civil Rights Clinic at Howard, um, which is a course that is somewhat different than most courses in the law school. Um, that is, the Civil Rights Clinic in the law school operates as a civil rights law firm inside the school. And in that capacity, what we do is that we take on actual cases, be it on behalf of individual litigants or on behalf of institutions, and we litigate these cases with the help of students. 
um, the students themselves perform all the work under my supervision because there are some special rules in most jurisdictions, including DC, that permits law students to actually practice law if they do so under the supervision uh, of a professor. Um, I have run the clinic for approximately five years, and typically what we do in the clinic is that we engage in what we call impact litigation. That is, instead of focusing entirely on a single individual, we tend to do cases that we believe are socially significant. So among the cases that we've done over the last few years is that we participated in the last case that the Supreme Court took on the issue of equal protection in primary and secondary school education. Um, the case is a so-called Seattle School District case, which is the last case that gave any significant interpretation of Brown v. Board of Education. Uh, just approximately a year and a half ago, we participated in the so-called voting rights cases. Um, this was a case that challenged the constitutionality of Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. Uh, we wrote a brief in that case both on behalf of ourselves in the clinic and then we wrote a second brief on behalf of Representative John Lewis out of Georgia, who most of you probably know was instrumental in the passage of the Voting Rights Act because he was one of the marchers on the Edmund Pettus Bridge um, who got beaten up and that created such a stir in the national media that barely two or three months after the event, Johnson submitted the Voting Rights Bill to Congress and they passed it soon after. We've also participated uh, in writing various briefs in virtually every single of the uh, same-sex marriage equality cases that have gone on in this country. We wrote a brief um, in the case in California from a couple of years ago, not the recent one, um, in which we examined the history of the opposition to interracial marriage prior to Lovett versus Virginia and the current opposition to same gender marriage. Uh, we followed up with a similar brief in the Varnum case out of Iowa that also took up the same principle. And just recently we were asked by the law firm of Ted Olson and David Boyce to submit an amicus brief in the latest Prop 8 case that now is going up to the Ninth Circuit. In addition to this sort of large um, impact cases, we sometimes take on individual clients if the issue that is involved is one that concerns a particular difficult area of law. So one of the few, some of the cases that have been litigating quite a bit over the last few years are racial profiling cases. Uh, in particular, out of Maryland, we've took on, we've took on quite a few cases involving uh, African-American males who are stopped on various highways in Maryland, mostly um, around Howard County and Allegheny County, um, supposedly on various traffic pretexts. But the pattern of these stops tend to be fairly similar. Uh, the individuals get stopped on the highway, but in for speeding, for example, but instead of the officer um, giving them a ticket while there, they are actually directed to drive fairly long distance off of the highway into a side road, into a parking lot where they're taken off, uh, taken out of the car and then systematically searched, supposedly for the search for drugs. But the last thing that I'll say about the case before I move on to just a few words about the topic of civil rights in the post-racial era is that the main case the clinic has been litigating for almost three years, which is currently in discovery, is a case in which we brought a lawsuit against the state of Maryland arguing that the state has continued to operate a segregated system of higher education. Specifically, if you look at the Maryland's um, schools, HBCUs, and you compare them to the Maryland's traditionally white institution, it is rather extraordinary uh, the huge gap and disparity that exists in terms of budget, funding, faculty support, facilities, etc. The Supreme Court in a case called Fordas a few years ago said that HBCUs that are run by states are not necessarily unconstitutional. That is, if the identity of the school is to be an HBCU. But what the state has to do is to essentially treat the schools, it is HBCUs, equally as with the TWIs, to the point that when a student makes a decision to attend a school, whether that student is black or white, the student is not going to make the decision based purely on the resources that the school will offer. 
Uh, we've been doing that case for almost three years. We recruited a firm to help us in the case, Kirkland and Ellis. The case is in discovery. We just completed discovery, and chances are we're going to go to trial um, in January of 2011. Um, <coughs> one of the interesting projects the clinic does sometimes is that in addition to uh, doing cases, we actually testify before Congress. And a year ago, the clinic was asked to testify before the Judiciary Committee of the House on the question of the civil rights record of the Supreme Court under Justice Roberts. And we actually analyzed every single case that the court had decided in the last five years since Roberts and Alito were on the court at the same time, just to see whether there is a pattern as to what you can describe as a civil rights record of the court and the country in general. And this is what I would say. You know, when, when, when historians and scholars, such as Professor Stewart, look at civil rights in this country, if you leave aside the slavery period, they tend to divide the civil rights uh, into three main periods. The first period is the so-called Reconstruction period, beginning with the end of the Civil War, the country ratified three constitutional amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th. But in addition to that, for approximately 10 years, the country, the Congress also passed a series of extraordinarily advanced for their time, and even for modern time, civil rights statutes in 1866, 1870, 71, and 75. And these statutes, had they been enforced, probably never would have permitted um, segregation. But unfortunately, the Supreme Court in a series of cases called Slaughterhouse, Cushank, and the civil rights cases did not really permit enforcement. So once you go past the Reconstruction era, you get into what most scholars call the Plessy era, uh, meaning an era where essentially Congress backed out of civil rights enforcement. The Supreme Court pretty much shut down civil rights enforcement, and the court explicitly or implicitly sort of validated segregation. And we didn't come out of the Plessy era until uh, probably 1954 with Brown. And now we are in the third so-called period of post-Brown era. I think if I were to describe where we are today, I would call it a sort of not post-racial civil rights era. I think we are in a post-modern Plessy era in the sense that where we are is a place where it is unlikely that the Supreme Court will ever truly reverse most of the gains that have been obtained through statutes since Brown. But it is also the case that the Supreme Court, in interpreting various constitutional provisions, be it the Commerce Clause, 11th Amendment Sovereign Immunity, has essentially taken the position where it's not going to truly advance um, the area of civil rights much further than, than where it is now. Um, and indeed, if you were to look at most of the Supreme Court cases that have been decided for the past four years, even when in fact you can describe them as a sort of victory, sort of the voting rights case where the Supreme Court declined to overturn the Voting Rights Act, it did so while at the same time sending fairly, fairly strong signal that at the first opportunity when it gets its votes, it's probably going to overturn Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. And it has done so consistently with almost every single major civil rights cases that we've done. And I don't necessarily think it's just because, and this is the last thing I'll say before I turn it to my co-panelist, that the court is purely hostile to civil rights. I think the issue is really comes to this. When we adopted the 1787 Constitution and the amendments that followed, we did so because we were paying homage to what we believe was the fundamental principle upon which the country was founded, namely liberty. Namely, we believe that the highest value that we could follow as a constitutional country was liberty interest, that the government respects your right best when it leaves you alone. So if you look at the 1787 Constitution, as well as the um, First Ten Amendments, that's basically what they are. It's simply the right to be left alone. It wasn't until the Reconstruction Amendments with the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment that we took seriously the counter principle, namely the equality principle. It wasn't enough for the government to leave you alone. The government also had to guarantee a certain minimum level of equality. 